So looking at NC State Purdue tipping off the number one seed from the Midwest region, the Boilermakers, a nine point favorite consensus line. There are some juiced NC State's nine and a half, like minus 120 over at BetMGM and minus 114 at FanDuel. Recording this here on Thursday night, you could price shop over at thelines.com. And the total for this game, 146, 146 and a half. There's a flat 146 over at FanDuel. Our price shopping tool is fantastic to find the best number for spread, total, player props over at the lines. But Jordan, I want to start with you because you're looking at an angle for the total in this game. Yeah, I think both teams have um, some fairly significant paths to offense. Uh, I think a lot depends on the personnel that gets on the court for both sides. Um, You know, I don't think we're going to see a lot of the straight up Burns versus ED matchup that a lot of people want to see. I don't think Painter is going to have him, you know, trying to defend Burns one-on-one with spin moves. And he kind of, Painter shades uh, ED behind uh, Trey Kaufman-Wren a lot. And I think we're actually going to see Kaufman-Wren on him. So if Burns is able to work against Kaufman-Wren, I think we'll see Painter trade some offense there and go with Gillis at the four. At which case, then Burns can't cross match with that, and Burns will have to guard Edie, which he can't do. And uh, I think that opens a lot of offense up for Purdue. And also, uh, NC State's been really good against drop coverage lately. They've tweaked a lot of things in this run, and they run a lot of um, like dribble handoff action in the middle of the floor there. And Purdue has a tough time navigating those kind of secondary screens. And we saw Tennessee have some success with that. And NC State runs a pretty similar offense to what Tennessee is going to do in terms of their um, off-ball actions and screening for Horn in the middle of the floor against drop coverages. So I think there's a path to offense for both teams, especially if the right personnel gets on the floor in terms of trading Gillis for uh, TKR. And Eric, to you next, you're looking at a prop for this game that correlates in a sense with Jordan's take on the total just in terms of both offenses having success. Yeah, um, so my prop bet that I picked here is going to be Mohamed Diarra scoring over eight and a half points in this game. Uh, he scored 11 plus in five of his last seven. For whatever reason, the Ramadan holiday is working well for him. And that's one of the, there's a story that I was reading about that. And I don't know if there's an overlap there. Uh, Burns' availability is going to be a, a question. You know, obviously the, the, the ongoing situation with Edie is he's going to get the opposition in foul trouble time and time again. Is that going to be a problem for Burns at some point in this game? And with the size that Diara has, he may be needed more than ever in this game. Since he started consistently contributing 30 plus minutes a game back in early February, he's had more than three personal fouls just twice. So that's not like he's going to be a, in, in foul trouble. So this, he could be seeing a lot of court time in this game. Expect him to step out and hit at least one three, maybe two threes. If he drops just two threes, he two, he's two thirds of the way there for that prop bet. So this is one of those where I look at, at NC State, you know, Purdue performs worse against squads that convert well from outside the arc. NC State meets those qualifications. They're number 52 in the country and adjusted three point percentage. I just see all the, the stars align for DR to actually put up some some quality points in this game, probably hitting double digits, in my opinion. And pretty much across the board, eight and a half. There are even some, I think, what is it? Let's see the sports book. FanDuel has minus 108. So a little bit cheaper on the VIG, depending on where you're looking. So my prop that correlates with yours are kind of go together, all of ours, but mine more so with yours there, just in terms of Diara specifically. I went with Diara to make a three. It's over under a half. So just one three needed for Diara. And my thought process is, Jordan, you kind of alluded to this with the matchup for Purdue defensively against NC State, but I kind of see it more as Kaufman ran against Burns and then Edie guarding Diara. And then Eric, you touched on it with floor spacing teams, or at least teams that have that stretch five that could space Edie out because Edie plays drop coverage. Diara shoots it. If you look at his three point attempt rate nationally, it's in the, I think the 63rd percentile. So he's shooting about two or three threes a game in the tournament. The attempt should be there. My only question is Jordan, you were mentioning how NC state has adjusted some things with their ball screen action in the half court offensively. NC state's pick and roll defense has gotten better, but that's obviously an area that Purdue is going to want to exploit. So whether it's Middlebrooks, Diara, or Burns for that matter, caught 
in that pick and roll coverage. I am a little bit concerned with DR maybe picking up a cheap one or two, uh, depending on who just gets caught theoretically yeah. guarding ED on those ball screens, but any takes there? No. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, you know, they, to improve their pick and roll defense, they often turn to middle Brooks. He's just a little bit more solid, knows where to get on the floor more than Burns. Burns, you know, just, he just doesn't really try all that often <laughs> defensively. <laughs> uh, you know, he's conserving, conserving energy for the other end. So yeah, that would be a concern, but you know, for the Diara three and the Diara over, they kind of, um, like you said, I think they're probably going to have Edie kind of cross matched against him. And they kind of just park him in the corner a lot in their offense lately. And he's hit several of those corner threes. And because teams, that's their option to like leave him. They kind of just leave him alone if he, when he's in the corner. So he's had those wide open game after game through the ACC tournament and this tournament. So, you know, I think that's a, a really feasible path for him staying on the or I guess at the other end of the court with NC State's three-point defense one thing that we should highlight Wolfpack are allowing just below a 24 percent clip from behind the arc in the tournament now pick and roll defense has improved to an extent for the Wolfpack and they generated turnovers against Marquette as and as a result with those ball screen actions that Marquette wants to run pick and roll. At the same time, Purdue pick and roll frequency top 65 as we both have gotten into. And the Boilermakers didn't shoot well against Tennessee. A lot of those threes, especially in the first half, you mentioned corner threes with Diara. Gillis missing two wide open corner threes. Does Purdue get back on track from deep? Eric, I want to go to you here. Do you expect the Boilermakers to kind of expose NC State's fraudulent defense to an extent, even though the market rating has improved because they've inevitably improved from the ACC tournament onward. Well, the NC State's defense is not terribly fraudulent. Their defense, in, from an efficiency standpoint, is better than their offense. Um, 19th in, in adjusted three-point percentage. They do allow those shots to come, so they're 157th in defensive three-point attempt rate. So Purdue will get their opportunities on paper. Uh, but when it comes to defending it, the adjusted, uh, three point percentage against the average division one opponent is 30.6%, um, which is pretty solid from the big, sta- from uh, the big, in the big scheme of things. Um, but you know, I, it's just, you know, it's going to be the question of can they get back on track? I wish I had those answers. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to find the reasons why NC State could actually win this game. We've been doubting them the entire way. Um, you know, obviously the, the, the chant, the thing that Purdue performs worse against teams that convert well from the outside. The other thing I want to bring up is the experience level for NC State. Top seven contributors are upperclassmen, five seniors. Uh, will that backcourt create problems? That, that backcourt of Horn and Morsell create problems for Smith and Lawyer. I don't know if that's going to be the case, but that's another thing to kind of keep in mind in this game. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up. And Jordan, I want to swing it to you here next because. I was considering just in terms of Horn or Morcell's player prop when it came to scoring. Now, Horn's prop has gotten bet up from 15 and a half to 16 and a half as of Thursday. Morcell's still in the 10 and a half range. And when we speak to ED drop coverage, it's not just the five man. So Diara getting open looks theoretically from behind the arc. It's those guards being able to attack with ED dropping back and hitting some mid range shots like we've seen with. Boo Booey in Northwestern Purdue earlier this year. I went back even further going back to last year with Jalen Huchifino having a dominant game at Mackie Jordan. I'm sure you remember that well. So I want to get it, get to that and get your uh, thoughts there. And then also on the flip side of the ball, how much of an impact do you see Morcell having against Braden Smith and maybe Braden Smith's props, whether it comes to scoring or distributing and or both just because Morcell impacted the game a ton on, at the defensive end against Duke on Sunday. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so the first one, I think Horn is going to be used very similar, similarly to the way Tennessee used uh, Dalton Connect. Obviously, he's not the same level of scorer as Connect, but he's, you know, he has the same kind of package. He can score off the dribble. They run him off a lot of those pin downs uh, in the middle of the floor as well. Um, and kind of that shrunken offense, kind of flex style offense that Rick Barnes likes. Keats does a lot of that as well. And so I could see Horn having the same amount of volume. Um, you know, I'm not saying he's going to score close to 40 or whatever Connect had, but he's going to have the same amount of volume, same amount of actions ran for him, same ability to get to the free throw line. 
Um, so Horn, I think, you know, if NC State's going to compete in this game, he's going to have 20 plus, obviously. Um, defensively, you know, uh, it's a NC State's scheme has changed. If you go back and watch some of their like, you know, midseason ACC games, they weren't doing as much switching up top. Uh, and they are now like they switch everything one through four almost. And that's caused a lot, uh, I think, more connectedness defensively, which is, you know, there's a lot of luck involved, like the way Mar- Marquette was missing just a lot of open threes. Obviously, we all watched that. The visuals weren't great, you know, <laughs> like a lot of those shots were wide open. But, you know, NC State is switching a lot more. And so they're able to contest a little better, I think, than maybe they were um, prior to this miracle run. And, you know, Smith and Lawyer have definitely improved in their ability to handle aggressive guards or ball pressure. Like that was obviously the knock on them last year. Like you can get into their jersey, they're young, they get frustrated, they turn the ball over. But still, this year, uh, Purdue is 29 and 0 when their turnover rate is below 20 percent. Four and four when their t- turnover rate creeps above 20 percent. You know, NC State Keats is a pressure guy. You know, he's a Patino guy, but they have really cut back on their press rate a lot. Just I'm guessing because of the sheer volume of games they've had to play. Uh, down the stretch here but you know with the time off I wonder if there's going to be some more press packages we see where they can you know get more sell and O'Connell especially has been just an unbelievable defender especially switching Um, so I'd like you know I think they could probably extend pressure a little more and really try to get into Smith and Lawyer and just disrupt the offense in general push them around Smith you know he used to get a little frustrated with hard hedging NC State's not going to be doing that that much. They just can't. They will with Middlebrooks, but absolutely not with Burns. Um, but Smith has totally destroyed hedge defenses lately. Uh, so I don't think that's going to be an option. But we'll see if they extend a little more pressure than they have been during this run. Yeah, and even if they don't, and even if it is just that half court, maybe. I mean, you're a dog, so going right. for a couple extra steals, whatever it may be. Eric, you remember the game in the Big Ten, and so do you, Jordan, but obviously Eric being a Wisconsin fan, Big Ten tournament semifinals, Hepburn got it his grill in the half court. I don't think Wisconsin, correct me if I'm wrong, either of you guys, pressed much, if at all, in that game, but Hepburn's defense against Smith definitely got him frustrated. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, Wisconsin doesn't really do the the pressure like that. But I mean, to to Jordan's point, a year ago, and one of the the, the metrics that I track is potential points off of steals. Um, as far as giving up those points, last year Purdue was 190th in the country. This year they're up to 60th. So obviously, there's a little bit more experience, a little bit more confidence with the guys like Lawyer and and and, and Smith. Um, that's going to be a problem for NC State. Um, I, I don't know. You know, the one thing I keep coming back to is the fact that these guys are still underclassmen. They're still sophomores. And I go back and I always, and I've had this discussion with a buddy of mine about the difference in bodies between a sophomore and a senior. And when you're dealing with seniors that have two years experience and two years of muscle, is that going to make any sort of difference against these guys? If these guys can bully them around a little bit, that that's a question that I have to ask. And that would be something that NC State probably has to take advantage of if they're, if they're hoping to win this game. Um, I'm just trying to find any reason why NC State can win this game. But then again, I've been saying that question or trying to answer that question for the last nine games now, or not nine games, because that would include probably like Louisville. But going back this entire tournament, every game they're supposed to be losing. Um, I feel the same here. But then again, they keep proving the doubters wrong. If Purdue goes 2 of 15 from 3 like they did against Tennessee, maybe maybe it happens. But Jordan, any closing thoughts to Eric or what I was discussing? No, just Eric uh, briefly mentioned going back to that Louisville game. I remember Horn didn't, he warmed up to play, then didn't. And I remember thinking, ah, these guys have cashed it in. They're done. Like, you know, Horn doesn't even want to play at this point. And I, I was like, forget about NC State. Like, uh, and just could not have been more wrong, obviously. That, that they game were, was tied. That game was tied, yeah. I think, with with under four and a half to play. Yep. And I mean, just amazing that I, and I even said something on Twitter this week. I'm like, what were the odds at that point that they would make the final four at that very minute? What were the odds that yeah, they would make the final four? The O'Connell, um, buzzer beater against the Miss Virginia free throw. Yeah. And then the O'Connell right. buzzer beater. But yeah, the Louisville thing is just as crazy to me too. It could have ended right there, you know? Right. Right. Against Louisville of all teams. <laughs> 
wild. And you go back to before the ACC tournament, NC State was a thousand to one to win the national championship. So not necessarily final four odds, Eric, but that was before the tournament began, before they came back against Kenny Payne, rest in peace to the Kenny Payne era for (laughs) anybody down in Louisville listening or watching. And then go on the run. You beat UNC in the ACC tournament championship game, 200 to one entering the NCAA tournament. Now I think as high as 20 to one to win the title. And Looking at both of these point spreads, just to bring up the nugget, because none of us are betting on the line for Purdue and NC State, it looks like 21, 20 and a half is the combined point spread for both teams. And that's the combination of the two point spreads is the biggest in semifinal, the second biggest uh, combination in national semifinal history dating back to the last 60 years you have to go back to ucla and unc in 1972 so substantial favorites yes and if you're looking for us to bet the point spread that kind of tells you why like jordan are you on the same page with me that the implied probability with purdue being priced into the money line the way they are and produce point spread for that matter. The market is is sharp at this point in the season. We're not talking about a December game, a mid major game that you may be even able to move the line. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you summed it up exactly with um, the implied odds in the money line, and like it's just I have no appetite to bet either side. In you know, like um, I I'll get a little cute with Alabama and UConn, but with Purdue NC State, just no desire to bet either side um, spread-wise.